One of the things that I'm finding is very valuable for my students is talking to them about how to use ChatGPT to study for financial management topics. And I'm going to focus on costing here because that is a little bit of an issue. So first of all, you get a free version of ChatGPT. So you can use that for free and obviously try it out and figure out how you feel about it. And the, there is a limitation on the amount of questions that you can ask. So there is a little bit of a limitation on that. But it does give you a feeling for what it is. The paid version is about $20 a month. And you need to decide whether or not that's valuable for you in terms of what you're going to get out of it. There are some functionalities that, 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 that you have in the paid version that you don't have in the free version. But I'm not entirely sure that you're actually going to need that. So let's jump into... Let's jump into how I would suggest that you use this or how I use it or I recommend my students use it in order to get the maximum value. You can use it as a lecturer, as a textbook, study guides, and most importantly, I think, is as a tutor that you can ask questions to and get answers from. And this, I think, is the most valuable thing for your learning. So what we don't want to do is just download loads of information that don't mean anything to us because then we may as well read textbooks, right? Or we may as well just listen to lectures. We want this to be a more active experience. So one of the things that I love about chat GPT that you're not going to get from Google is the fact that you can interact with it. If I look at a video on YouTube on standard costing, for example, it's a one-way experience. I'm listening to what you're saying, but I don't have the opportunity to ask the video, wait, this is what I understand by it. What if you do it this way? What if you're talking about that company? What if, what if? Whereas with chat GPT, you can. So the most valuable component of this for your learning is the ability to ask it questions about stuff you don't understand, specifically that it's going to answer in the same way that you would be sitting down with a lecturer and going, hey, I don't understand that. What if it was like this? Or I thought it was like that. Let's take a look. Let's take a look at how we can use this. Now, I want to be really clear that in my example, I'm not interested in costing theory. I'm not interested in teaching you costing. I am just want to show you the types of things that the tool can do so that you can go off and do it yourself and start exploring what it does. So ChatGPT is exactly that. It's a chat, right? So we're going to start a discussion and it's going to, we're going to continue the same discussion because we're chatting with it. So let's start off with a really basic idea, which is what types of costing methods are there for manufacturing companies? Let's press enter and see what it says. One of the things I want you to be aware of is that you can set the level of the complexity of the answer, again, something you can't really do, not even really with your lecturer, actually. So you, you can ask the same question and say, I want you to explain it to someone who's a professional. I want you to explain it to someone who's five years old. I want you to explain it to someone who's never touched the stuff before. You can set the levels depending on what you need, right? So what types of costing methods are there? Manufacturing companies use various costing methods, job order costing, each cost of each job or order is calculated separately. The methods of often used when products are custom made or have unique characteristics, process costing, when manufacturing processes are continuous, products are similar, etc. activity-based costing, more refined costing methods, standard costing, variable costing, absorption costing, marginal costing, job costing, backflash costing, haven't heard of that one before, simplified costing method used in just in time. So obviously some of them may or may not be relevant for your syllabus, but so we've got a list of them. Now we can say Give an example of a company that would use each of these. Make the examples simple. Notice, first, notice how fast it is. That's really scary. So then it goes back. Certainly, here are some examples. Job order costing, custom furniture maker, example. A custom furniture maker produces unique pieces of furniture. Process costing, soft drink manufacturer. Soft drink manufacturer processes large, large quantities. It's used to calculate average cost per bottle, etc. Activity based. Automobile manufacturer, standard costing toy manufacturer, variable costing t-shirt printer, electronics manufacturer for absorption. So you can see it's really basic and it's it's using examples that you can visualize, which is great because often I find when we're learning stuff, they'll use the pharmaceutical companies or mining industries, and you can't really visualize that. So when you're learning it, you don't really understand what it is. So then you can say, what's the difference between, let's say, standard costing. Again, I'm, I'm just showing you the tool. Standard costing and absorption costing. What would be the difference in the companies that they would choose one over the other? Now, this is important and this is valuable because what you're doing is saying, Here's two things that I don't really understand. I want you to explain the difference to me. And 
I want to be able to see why you would choose one and not the other. Now, in costing, this is really valuable because one of the things I find students struggle with at later levels is they've got all of these costing methodologies, but they can't really visualize why would I use that over that? Under what circumstances? What would the company look like? So when you give me a company and a case study and you go, hey, what costing method would, would you use? I struggle to decide which one to use because I'm actually not really comfortable in my head with what the difference of these are. And I've spelled absorption wrong. That's probably bugging a couple of you OCD peeps. All right. Our two distinct methods, standard costing involves setting predetermined cost standards for various cost components, the calculation, the various analysis, use case, absorption costing, full costing, purpose. There it is. Choosing between standard depends on a company's objectives and reporting requirements. Standard costing is ideal when companies want to closely monitor cost control, identify variances from expected costs, use the information for internal decision making. Absorption costing is preferred when a company needs to comply with external standards, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see it's saying this is what this is, this is what this is, and this is why one would choose one over the other. If I was working with a bakery, would I use job costing? So you can ask it a case study or a situation and say, well, I think that I would have used this. Tell me whether or not that's true. Yes, a bakery can use job costing as a cost accounting method to track and allocate costs associated with baking projects or jobs. Job costing is particularly suitable for businesses that produce custom or unique products such as specialty cakes, pastries, etc. Here's how job costing might work for a bakery. So it's explaining to you what would work, but it's focusing on the fact that this is for unique items. But obviously you're going, yeah, I'm not talking about a bakery that does unique items. So what about a normal bakery that just sells bread and cakes so you go that's fine you're focusing on that but now what about just a normal bakery because that's what i had in my head just a normal bakery a normal bakery that primarily sells standard bread and cakes without customization may not typically use job costing as extensively as a bakery instead they may employ a simpler costing method depending on its specific needs here's a couple of accounting methods or cost accounting methods they may use process costing weighted average first in first out retail method Depends on the bakery specific operations, product offerings, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see that you can start to get a picture of what it is and what it isn't. And you can say, well, in this company, in that company, in this situation, in that situation, how does this actually work? So we can say, how, how does process costing work? Okay, so that's a pretty vague question. So it's going to give you a lot of detail. So you can start off very vague. And then you can drill down and go, I understand that, I understand that, I don't understand that. So now process costing, costing is to determine average cost of producing homogenous products in a continuous repetitive production environment or process that identify, here's how it works, identify the production processes, so he explains it, accumulate costs by process, calculate equivalent units, determine total, total costs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is now explaining what this is and it's giving you these steps. That gives you an indication of, of how that works. Now we can drill down and go, it's okay, great and everything. What companies, what types of companies would use process costing? So I'm like, I want, I want something a little bit more visual. Chemical manufacturing, food processing, textile industry, oil refining, etc. So it's giving you some examples and it's explaining, it's explaining a little bit. So let me choose one of these and go something that I understand. When we're learning something, start up with something that's familiar to you that you can visualize and go food processing, producing items like breakfast, cereal, canned goods, beverages, etc. So let's say explain the steps of process costing you gave me using breakfast cereal company as an example. So this now starts to show you what I'm doing here is I'm saying you gave me information above now let's continue with that. So that's where the chat function comes in, where you can go back to that and go in. Previously, you told me X, Y, Z. Can we continue? You want to continue that conversation. So let's walk through the steps using a breakfast cereal manufacturing company as an example. Identify the production process. So now it gives you an example. The processes may include accumulate costs by process, calculate equivalent units, determine the total cost. And it's all giving you examples along the way. To find the cost per equivalent unit, divide the total cost of each process by the equivalent units produced during that process. Then you can say, well, how would I find the equivalent costs? How would I, how would I know what the equivalent costs are? 
to find the equivalent cost and process cost and calculate the cost per equivalent. And then he has how to calculate it. Calculate the total cost for each process, equivalent units for each. And so you can see that you can now break it down and go well, explain that, explain that, explain that, explain that. Calculate the total equivalent cost, the sum up, etc. We can get more specific and go, well, what I really want to know is how would you calculate a specific cost? So how would you deal with electricity costs because there's a specific cost and you're saying i don't know what you do with that how do you deal with that so here's the steps to handle electricity costs determine how much electricity is used in your production process calculate the costs determine the allocation basis machine hours and calculate the allocation rate allocate electricity to processes so now when you first when you're first studying this, you're going, what is the allocation rate? What do you mean when you say the allocation base? So we want to understand what the allocation base is. What is an allocation base? Explain to someone who's never studied costing. So again, we can really simplify this and go, if I've never touched the stuff before, explain it to me. It's like a fair sharing rule used, the company uses to divide up certain costs among many different parts of the business. Imagine you and your friends want to split the cost of renting a big house for a weekend getaway. To do this fairly, you might use the number of people staying in each room as the allocation base. So here's how it would work. The allocation base is a scenario is the number of people in each room. The cost is the total amount and the parts of the different rooms in the house. So you'd calculate how much each room should pay based on how many people are staying there. If one room has more people, it pays a bit more because it's using more of the share cost. So in a business allocation base is similar. So you can see how simple it is. And it's giving you examples that you can visualize and, and you can simplify it. So let's say you can give another, give another simple example. And if you're trying to visualize something, you can keep doing this. <laughs> You can keep doing this and go, oh, give another example, give another example, give another example. So let's consider an example involving a group of friends sharing the cost of ordering pizzas. In this case, the allocation base. So you can see it's giving you the same breakdown, but now it's giving you a different example. So now you say, oh, let's bring this back to business. Give an example. If I was working in a business where I needed to allocate rental costs, for example. Let's say you work in a co-working space, your company shares the cost, the allocation base, et cetera, et cetera, the different parts of the business. Here's how you might allocate it. So the total allocation basis, they're using employees. And so they're giving you the same example. And you go, what if, could you, or let's say, could you allocate on the basis of space that different processes take up in the factory? So this is now, you can see, I'm now asking questions of, I want to explore this further. I want to go into that. How does, how does this work? So yes, you can allocate on the car and it takes you back to the same calculation. It explains it for you, et cetera. So now let's say we want to, I want to ask a specific question of something that I thought. This is what I understood by this. I thought we could allocate costs on the basis of how much money each product or each type of product makes. You make an expensive product and a cheap product, so therefore the expensive product should bear more of the cost, for example. So now you're asking it a question, and you're going, well, can we do that? And it explains to you how we can do this, what this is, known as revenue allocation. We'll say, oh, okay, that, is actually, that is actually how that works. What about on the salaries of the managers? So now it's, I mean, it's being a little tactful. <laughs> Allocating the salaries of management can be a bit more challenging than direct costs like rent or utilities. However, it's still possible to allocate salaries based on reasonable allocation basis. And here we go. Then it explains time allocation, revenue allocation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, so the salary of the bar manager would be taken into account for standard costing. Again, I'm trying to give it, this is what I think. Can you give me an example? In standard costing, the focus is primarily on established predetermining predetermined standard costs for direct overheads, etc. The salary of an HR manager, which is an administrative or indirect cost, is typically not included in the calculation. So the beauty of this that I'm trying to show you, and this is where the most value for this tool comes in, is your ability to ask it and say, this is what I understand. You, you can put calculations in there. You can put numbers in here. In the paid version, you can add in PDFs. So you can, you can give it a PDF to read 
and then ask it questions on the basis of that PDF. You can't do that in the free version. So that's very valuable if you're taking a look at questions and you're saying, this is a question and this was the solution they gave me. I don't know why they said that. So in the paid version, you can upload a PDF of the question and the solution and go, where did they get that from? How did they come to that number? How should I have known that? Where did they come from? So that's pretty valuable in the paid version. You can copy excerpts from the PDF in there. So you have the PDF or you have the question electronically, you can copy parts of that question out and put it in here and ask exactly the same question. As a starting point, thinking about thinking about your financial management, especially you, you want to get a really good understanding and visualization of what each of these things are for. And especially for costing, you have all these costing tools. You need to understand why would you use that and not that? And then how does that work? What is happening in this company that they choose standard costing that's not happening in that company? And so therefore standard costing isn't appropriate, right? You want to be able to understand, oh yeah, that's not going to work for you. Oh yeah, that is going to work for you because you do X, Y, Z. I really like this because one, you generally don't have time. You don't have a lot of time with lecturers and tutors. So when you do have time, you're limited to a certain amount of stuff that you can ask. It's not instant. So if I'm studying at 10 o'clock at night and I have a question, yeah, I can send an email off to my lecturer, but I'm not going to get a response for day two, maybe even longer. And so what do I do in the meanwhile? Whereas this is instant. Another reason I like this is because ChatGPT doesn't, it doesn't judge you if you're wrong. So I know a lot of students don't ask questions that they genuinely have because they think it's too stupid. I should know that by now. I mean, post-grad, I shouldn't be asking about the basics of standard costing. My lecturer is going to freak out or think that I'm not studying. So I like the fact that there's no judgment here. It's instant. It's customized. It's, and you can just keep on going, give me a really complicated answer. So give me a really complex answer as though I was talking to the CFO of the company. Okay. So let's, let's do that. Explain, explain this again as though I'm talking to a CFO and I want to impress her with my technical knowledge. Let's see what it comes up. So the difference would be the difference would be the terminology is a little bit different. And especially when you're coming to, to, to technical stuff, it explains the same stuff, but it's just changing the tone of it to be a little bit more professional and a little bit more formal. What are the common challenges that companies using process costing face? Again, I'm just giving examples of the types of things that you can do with it. Companies that you may encounter several common challenges, accurate cost allocation, da -da 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 -da, variable inputs. So it's giving you a bunch of stuff that goes, these are the types of things that you're going to find challenging. And then you can drill, you can drill down into them and go, okay, how would this work? Okay, let's look at waste and spoilage. How would I, because we, we know that normal spoilage, you can add into the cost abnormal. How would I know whether spoilage is normal or abnormal? Depending on whether spoilage is, it depends on various factors, industry standard, historical data, production process, cause of spoilage, consistency, etc. So what if someone has an accident and the company pays for hospital fees. I don't have to say to it, I'm still talking about spoilage because it's carrying on the conversation. So it knows that I'm referring to spoilage, right? So when an employee has an accident, the company pays for their hospital fees. This expense is typically, typically categorized as an employee benefit or personal cost rather than spoilage or production related costs. So it, it's carrying on the conversation. It knows what I'm asking. Okay, and then we can we can incorporate in this this to the rest. So this, okay, how would I treat this cost in the financial statements if I was using Ifris? So yeah, now you can go straight across and go, well, this is the management accounting stuff. How would this be recognized in the financial statements? And you need to clarify that you're using Ifris, right? So obviously ChatGPT is global. So Ifris is not the only thing that exists. So you need to class clarify this is the standards that I'm using. Recognition as expense, accrual basis, measurement, disclosure, compliance, internal controls, consider other standards. And it's giving you, depending on specific circumstances, use IS 37. So it's giving you the accounting treatment. What about taxation if it was in South Africa? Let's see. So we're, we're dealing with, we're still dealing with the accident. The company paid hospital fees for the accident. So how would you deal with this 
if you're dealing with accounting. And now, now let's talk about the tax, right? The tax treatment of expenses such as hospital fees is governed by SARS and Income Tax Act. Here's how they're typically treated. Deductibility as an expense, matching principle, documentation, records, compliance with tax regulations, reporting, reimbursement. So here's a tricky one. I'm not sure if it can do this. Can you give me the section numbers in the Tax Act that would be relevant here? I don't actually know if it would do that. We typically fall under general provisions. However, please note that I don't have access to the current South African tax code. Laws can change over time. So ChatGPT is still, this one I think is still based on information from 2021. So that's not that's not particularly going to help you because that would be pretty fun. <laughs> that would be pretty, pretty cool. What would, what would the external auditor be concerned about with, in this case, what would the risk of material misstatement be? So we, obviously we've moved a little bit away from costing now, but I'm trying to show you the, how great the tool is to integrate your understanding, break down, this is management accounting, et cetera, et cetera. And you, how you can use it, different types of questions. When the auditors, you know, such as hospital fees, several areas of concern, ex, expense recognition, matching, documentation, substantiation, tax compliance, disclosure and reporting, reimbursement. So it's giving you an indication of, the types of things that you that you're going to be concerned about. There's there's so many valuable things here, but the ability to break down those barriers and for you to explore. And I want you to do that when you're dealing with stuff in accounting. I want you to say, well, how would this look on a daily basis? What would management be interested in? How would this actually work for the auditor? Because that way you integrate your understanding. The the challenge you have when you get into business is that you're not working with management accounting. Auditing, accounting, taxation. Taxation is part of your accounting stuff. So that everything comes together. And when you start working, it can sometimes be difficult to break down those barriers. We call them silos and go, well, actually, I'm auditing the financial accounting. So it's all just one thing. <laughs> the financial accounting's got to take into account what the management accountant is doing and then figure out what he's doing or she's doing and then put that into the financials, how that should work. And there's tax implications on that. And then obviously the auditor is going to come after that and go and audit that. Do you understand what that looks like in terms of actual integration? So that may be a little bit higher grade depending on, on, on what you're actually dealing with at the moment. And that's just me getting excited about the learning stuff. But what I really want you to get from this is the value of this as a teaching tool and as a learning tool that you can explain. You can ask it to give you examples, to visualize stuff. But again, I want to emphasize the value and the importance of you saying, this is what I think. So this is what I understand you're saying. And it will correct you. It will confirm. It'll tell you if it doesn't really know. And we know that there are mistakes. ChatGPT is not perfect, but in terms of the stuff that you're using it for, it is incredibly valuable for, for your tool. And in terms of your learning, and I'm going to repeat this again, because we're so used to having our knowledge and our information come to us. My lecturer is explaining it to me. The textbook's explaining it to me. Even when I watch YouTube videos, someone else is explaining it to me. My ability to explain it to someone else is incredibly valuable. So I want you to be able to put in here, this is what I understand um, standard costing is. And then I want you to explain it and go, is that correct? And it will explain it. You can give examples and go, so it would be like saying this, or so these two are the same thing. I think the students that are studying distance, the students that don't have continuous access to, to lecturers and teachers, this type of thing is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely incredibly valuable. So go play with it, go play with it, go look at it, and you'll see, I think you're going to be really, really excited about what it can do for your studying and your understanding of 